Welcome to ECE 501B, which is Advanced Linear Systems Theory. I will typically start the class with this being displayed on the screen, some announcements and some goals for that particular class period. I've already talked about the attendance sheet. If you're online, that won't mean anything to you. If you're on campus, I hope you understand how to sign in to the class for today. I need you to make sure that you have access to D2L. That's how we will be collecting and distributing information, both on campus and online. You've already, I hope, maybe received the email. Maybe you haven't been in email contact today. I sent you an email. Hopefully you received it telling you that there is an assignment already due. It's due at 11.59 on Sunday evening. That should be, I hope, August 30th. That's the passport assignment. And that's one of our goals. Today's goals are really sort of in two parts. The first part is going to be very quick. It's really just preliminaries going over attendance, recording, that that's what's going to be happening in class is we will be recording these lectures. I'll quickly discuss the passport assignment and the syllabus and then we'll get into the course itself, a very broad overview, and then we'll start chapter one of, I will typically either say Axler or the Yellow Book, and that's going to be where we will start this class. There's also another textbook that's available to you in D2L under course resources. And that's going to be in the second half, which will be infinite dimensional systems. The Axler or the yellow book, we will start learning these concepts in a finite dimensional setting. And the idea is that you can make that transition smoothly between the two different dimensionalities or the two different ways of talking about the same concepts in two different classes of problems, finite dimensional and infinite dimensional. Here's your first assignment. It's the passport into the class. Give me some way of maybe putting a name with a face. It'll be your name, and if you don't go by your given name, let me know what your nickname is. If you like to be called Bob, then that's your nickname. An email and an up-to-date photograph. Make sure that it's something that maybe looks somewhat close to what you presently look like. It shouldn't be your baby picture, because I may not be as good at doing the age progression that the milk cartons can do. So. Give me a picture that's maybe within the last decade that I can now tell who is who in the class. Some interesting fact about you that I might be able to connect the picture and the name with that fact, and that gives me a way of remembering the information. Maybe you are an expert table tennis player, or you do something else. Maybe you like to camp. Something that's maybe a little unique to you that will allow me to make that connection. Then we get into two more tasks in the passport. One is a learning style quiz, and this is really just to get you familiar with the idea that there are many different ways of learning material. And if you can take that quiz, then I want you to report the output of that quiz two different ways. One is by just recording it explicitly in your passport as shown here, whether you are an active or a reflective learner, and then there will be a number associated with that. Likewise for the other classes, sensing intuitive, visual, verbal, or sequential global. And then I've tried to create a quiz on D2L You'll go to the quiz tab in the menu bar and click, click on the learning styles data quiz. 
and there you can with multiple choices and there's only one choice allowed for each question it will say are you a visual learner and maybe you didn't register in the visual side so you'll say not applicable in a then it will say are you a verbal learner and maybe you scored a five with verbal then you'll hit the radio button for five and continue I hope it's clear and I hope it works this will hopefully give me a quick way to see the class as a whole if I can now extract that data more easily than having to read this off and maybe put it into a spreadsheet myself but now I have it in two different ways so that if one way doesn't quite work I will have it a second way as a backup the other task that I would like you to do as a part of your passport is to look at these two sheets single page sheets one is talking about 10 rules of good studying and the other one is 10 rules that aren't so good or the bad study and I want you to read through those and maybe identify with those in some way maybe there's a good studying habit that you're using or maybe you hadn't thought about that you want to try give me a couple of reasons why you liked that one and maybe a couple of reason or a reason why you may be identified with one of the bad study habits maybe it's something that you now know that you're prone to that and you haven't done that for a long time something to that effect that's the passport the other class business that we want to go through very quickly is the syllabus there are the office hours which don't mean a lot to the online students but hopefully you have some opportunity if you're on campus to see me in those blocks and you can see that they're not consistent at all from day to day so it may take me a semester to learn when I'm supposed to be in office hours those will be held in on the fifth floor of the ECE building there is a required text linear algebra done right and that's in yellow the cover is yellow so I highlighted it in yellow I will actually provide you with the second text which is signal theory talking about the infinite dimensional concepts that are covered in this class you'll have two midterms a homework and a project and here is how your grade will be determined we will always be in class on Mondays and Wednesdays so logically our final is on a Tuesday make sure that you have that date available the final exam is on a Tuesday and it's a little later than what we will normally be in class it's from 6 to 8 if you hit your stride at about that time good if you don't try to prepare for that in some way so that you're ready by the time we hit the middle of December and in particular the 15th on a Tuesday that you're ready to go for the final exam a couple of days that we won't be physically here that doesn't mean that I won't provide you with information <laughs> so I'll email you or post things via the news feed on D2L to try to get us comfortable with the material basically the first part of the class which is the majority will be spending in the Axler text and will work through its linear algebra done right which really means that trace and determinant in this way of presenting the linear algebra is at the very end and we'll start with vector spaces we'll start with some concepts in finite dimensional vector spaces as far as spanning linear independence then we'll talk about linear maps what vectors map to the null vector or to the origin which where can we get to from different maps or what's the range space is the map invertible we'll briefly maybe or you'll be on your own to think look at polynomials and the fundamental theorem of algebra in chapter four we'll then move into chapter five which talks about 
special properties or subspaces where the operator now remains or it's an invariant subspace. These are eigenvectors. And then we'll talk about inner products which allow us to get more geometrical concepts in play or this idea of orthogonality and nor orthonormalizing our vectors in that particular space which now allows us to do more interesting tasks or operations with these linear algebra concepts in the form of maybe a polar decomposition or a spectral theorem or singular value decomposition. Then we will try to apply that or make that somewhat transferable into the infinite dimensional case when we look at the Franks text, which is then on D2L under course resources. Are there questions about the class business or the preliminaries? Question. So the question, if I can paraphrase, is Axler is somewhat theoretical for, let's say, an engineering class, and that's true, but that's really one of the goals of this class, is to become more or to develop a better mathematical maturity. So we aren't going to shy away from the theory in Axler, but if we can apply it, and I think that will become a little bit more clear when I go through the course overview, there are everyday applications to this material. And now it's just a function of how do we make that connection. But it's important to know the theory behind the application. And so we'll try to make sure that we have both the theory well understood and the application. Other questions? If not, let's then move into the course motivation or overview of advanced linear system theory, but it's really just linear system theory. That's what an earlier course was called, so we t changed it to be advanced linear system theory to give it a unique title and work in the, in the university system. For this class, in general, you can think of it in a block diagram. Here's your sort of less abstract, or maybe it is abstract to you, but here's the abstract part of that. We might have a system that we will view as a map, and typically we will have inputs to that system. which we may call those signals, input signals, and it goes through the map or the system and produces output signals. And this particular signal and systems understanding or concept or structure is quite common or is very common, actually. And let's just illustrate that by some application areas where you might see this input going through a map producing an output. On the right-hand side, I will say here is our system. And then down on the left-hand side, let's look at some of the application areas. In particular, in a control application, the system could be just the controller that's being used to change the dynamic behavior or the performance of a system, or it could be the plant dynamics, or if you're not comfortable with the green leafy thing of a plant, this is really just the system dynamics, and you may actually want to 
be concerned with the interconnection structure of the controller and the plant? Or how do you design the controller to give you the closed loop behavior that you want between inputs and outputs in a control setting? That's one application area where these concepts are, are important. Another application area of interest is in signal processing, and I'm just going to lump all of the systems or the maps into filters. So you have some particular signal, and now you want to do something with that input signal for some particular reason. Maybe you're trying to do some image processing, maybe you're trying to discern edges or some shape, or maybe you're trying to do low-pass filtering. All of those you can think of as an input with a filter. That's your system producing some output. In communications, we can sort of look at many different pieces in the communication setup. For example, if you just think of your cell phone, now you have something that's going to, well, change your speech into something that we can now get across the world. So we have some transducer, maybe we encode that, and then we don't want everybody just shouting to go get your voice from point A to point B. So we may need to modulate that or do some kind of pre-processing. Then once we've modulated that information, onto a carrier, we can now send that information through the transmission channel. And once it gets to the destination, we may need to, or I'm hoping we want it to end up sounding like how it started. So that we may now need to demodulate, decode, and then maybe put that electrical signal through a speaker so that somebody can actually hear at the other end what you actually said on your end. Where now we have this, let's say, post-processing. And in a way, you could view that communications application as having three different systems. You have the pre-processing system, and now you have an output signal from that. You now want that output signal or you will need to know how that output signal is impacted by the transmission channel. And finally, once you go through the transmission channel, you could view that output of the transmission channel as an input to your post-processing and now the output of the post-processing is some sound that you can now listen to that started at the other end, maybe halfway around the world in a communications channel. Those are what you would typically see in an electrical and computer engineering curriculum, but you can also view this in many other diverse applications where the system might now be in the form of some kind of optical hardware where you have an input, now you go through some optics and you produce an output. And how do you represent that optics as a map that we can describe via linear algebra or linear maps? That's what we can now hopefully be able to do in terms of transitioning or moving this theory into an application. The nice thing is that all of those, whatever they represent in the application, can sort of be thought of in a very concise, more abstract way, which is what we will be talking about in this class.
or said another way, luckily, we can generalize and fold a large number of applications or application areas into a common mathematical framework. where now our abstract math environment will now be what we will call these linear vector spaces. That's not in the cloud. You're going to be learning it, but I'm sort of symbolizing it as this abstract idea of linear vector spaces. That's very generic or very general, and we will now separate that into two different sort of pieces. One piece, which is where we will start, the class is the linear algebra piece, which deals with the concepts in a finite dimension. And that's our first textbook. When we deal with finite dimensions, now in a linear vector space setting, we now are talking about linear algebra. If we go in the other direction or extend that to infinite dimensions, then you will typically hear this referred to as functional analysis. And that's where our second textbook picks up. So now we are going to try to learn this in very general terms so that the abstractness allows us to apply the generic or general concepts in both domains, finite dimensional and infinite dimensional. where now both domains share many features. And because of that, we will try to take advantage of what we learn from one domain to actually understand the other domain. And that actually is a powerful tool in the sense of how we learn. Maybe something seems really abstract. Maybe in the infinite dimensional case, it's not making sense to us. But if you now go back and you say, well, wait, what, what's the concept that we're really trying to understand? And you go into the finite dimensional case and you now say, oh, I know what we're doing in finite dimensions. That's what we're doing in infinite dimensional terms. And that hopefully will allow you to broaden 
and improve your understanding of both domains or the material in both domains. Also, this course, as I said earlier, will try to develop our mathematical maturity. And we'll be doing that by not just covering our eyes or glossing over, we're not going to shy away from the proofs. And hopefully during the course of this class, you will become a little bit more comfortable with proving things, and that will then enhance your mathematical maturity. In terms of how do we make this abstract material somewhat interesting or, in quotes, fun, maybe you didn't see that air quotes if you were online, but I included that fun in air quotes. Are there ways, or can we, and we will, we will, use some interesting, maybe interpret that fun. I know you probably never thought of papers, journal papers, as being fun, but as you mature, they become more fun We will, or interesting. We will use some interesting slash fun papers to connect. the theory with reality. For example, principle component analysis. Have you heard of that before? So now we'll look at one paper that talks about principal component analysis. A way to sort of visualize that is if you have, let's just, and we visualize things better in two or three dimensions, and then we generalize to higher dimensions. That's the whole point of this course. But if somebody now had to maybe parameterize or characterize that data that's in this two-dimensional space, maybe they might come up with a line that now captures the majority or the principal component of that information. This principal component analysis, analysis now allows us to find meaning from data, and maybe the way the data is presented to you, you can't see any meaning in it. And you now apply these techniques, and wow, it just sort of bubbles to the top in terms of understanding or seeing better meaning than just seeing the data by itself. The concepts that this relies on, or some of the concepts, are these maybe abstract ideas of symmetric matrices, which means that, oh man, he's talking about symmetric matrices, where does that have an application? Or what in the world is that? Now you can say, oh, symmetric matrices, well that's one way of thinking of that is related to principal component analysis, or PCA. Or another mathematical concept in that domain or in that application are eigenvalues. When you have eigenvalues, you usually have their sibling or the eigenvectors, and 
this is related to SVD, you might see the principal component analysis referred to as PCA, and the SVD is singular value decomposition. And we'll learn all of those throughout the course, and hopefully this one paper, if you're interested in that, allows you to see the connection of the theory with an application. This is the fall semester, which maybe this doesn't have any meaning anymore, but is anybody into sports? Have you seen BCS before? Do you know what that used to stand for? Might help if I would spell it right. Does that help? What sport was that used in the past? Bowl Championship Series. Do I have to put a helmet on? So it's football. This was now in this bowl championship series, they were trying to figure out who's the national champion. And they needed some way of ranking these teams, and it would have been ideal if all these teams played each other. But you can't have them playing 120 games or whatever to get the Division I teams all playing each other. So now, what is a method for ranking football teams? And that's actually presented in a paper as one of the references for this class. And one of the mathematical concepts that is used are positive matrices. And now, even though all of these teams do not play each other in pairs, you can still sort of compare similar opponents and see which team sort of bubble to the top as far as the top team using this football ranking. And you could do this in many, many other domains where maybe you have, I don't know, let's say 100 chess players, and now they do a competition or a, some games, and now you want to know who's the best chess player. And they're not all going to be ch playing each other, and maybe you don't have it bracketed out. You just have them playing in groups. What is a way to maybe rank those players? That's another paper that we will talk about. Maybe no one's heard of this, so you'll just have to maybe read about it. But Google. <laughs> Has anybody heard of Google? Probably, no. Well, one of the reasons why it sort of floated to the top was it was pretty good at ranking web pages. What is this Google page rank procedure? Or how did it know which page was more important than another page? What's the importance of web pages? And the paper that is available, and you'll maybe understand a little bit better after we get into some of these concepts, one of the phrases in the title is the 25, that's a B, billion eigenvector. The 25 billion is basically their value when they went public as far as Google. And how they became such a hit, how they were able to, on their initial public offering, raise $25 billion was all because of an eigenvector, an eigenvector problem.
and you thought eigenvectors weren't important. Now you can see maybe that somebody actually understood the theory well enough to now apply it in a domain that maybe you didn't even think about linear algebra when you're thinking about web pages. How, does, how do you connect web pages with linear algebra? And that's what this paper talks about. So, so the main thing are these eigenvectors, but there are also other matrix concepts that are talked about in that application paper. And there are other more applications of linear algebra, but those are the three that are included in the course resources location on the D2L website. And you'll be able to use those as either springboards or actual papers to work on in your project for this class. Once you've sort of understood these concepts at a better level. So now let's start working on that better understanding of these concepts and get into chapter one of the yellow text, which is the Axler text, which is linear algebra done right. A lot of times when we're dealing with abstract ideas and concepts, we have to get our terminology correct or at least understood. Build this background or this foundation. We're going to start with something that seems very maybe basic, the real line, but that's where everything sort of comes from. In this class, we not only talk about the real numbers, but also complex numbers, and those are just a connection or a certain combination of real numbers. But we will concentrate on two fields, where now we're using a new term maybe, but that's just a math concept that when start, people start saying something about, oh, consider these numbers on the real, the, or the field of real numbers, or the complex field of numbers. Now you'll know what that means. But we're going to concentrate on two fields, or these sets, from which we will draw numbers. And a lot of these concepts can actually be generalized to where we don't have to worry about numbers as our fields, but we are going to sort of focus on that more concrete concept of a field. We have the real numbers R, that's how I will refer to those as sort of these two verticals on the R, That's one of the two fields, and the second field is C. The complex numbers. These are the two fields that we will focus on in this class. This is where we're going to draw our numbers from, where in the complex numbers we have A plus, whoops, In electrical engineering, we may use J for the square root of minus one. Maybe the textbook will use I since it's coming maybe from a math background, but A plus IB, where A and B both are elements of the real numbers, and I in this case is the square root of minus one. So this epsilon looking symbol, we will use it much or a lot, and in this setting it just means replace that epsilon with the verbiage is an element 
uh, and that allows us to then write this in a more shorthand manner. Now we have A and B are elements of R and R are the real numbers. Now what are these concepts called fields, well they satisfy or they have several properties. One is they have this commutativity property which says that if you have A and B, an element of F, and now I'm using F as the book does to basically represent either R or C. So now you could say A and B are an element of the field where you could replace that F with either R or C and that's why I'm using F because typically it can be either one. So that now the commutativity property says that A plus B is equal to B plus A. That's the additive form of commutativity and then we have AB is equal to BA. So in this field of numbers their sum commutes as does their product. We have associativity where if we have three elements each in this set of numbers that are forming the field, we could say let's associate A and B first and add that to C. That's the same as saying A plus the combination of B plus C. Likewise in the multiplicative sense we have the product of AB. That product multiplied by C is the same as A with BC. We have commutativity, we have associativity, we have some identities in these fields. We have a 0 and a 1 in F or you could think of this as we have an additive identity which says that we have 0 plus A should give us back what we started with, A. And we also have a multiplicative identity which says that 1 times A doesn't change A. Where in both of these cases A is in the field of numbers. So we have two identities, an additivity, uh, an additive and a multiplicative identity. We also have inverses belonging to these fields. The first one is an additive inverse now we have an upside down A which means for all. So now for all A or for all elements in F, whoops what am I doing here? Leaving out the A. So for all A in the field there exists and I might actually look at some point put that as a backwards E there exists a minus A that also is in the field such that minus A plus A gives us the zero vector or I'm sorry, the zero element in that field. I'm getting into the vector spaces. All of these sort of carry over into the vector space, but now I'm just talking about fields. So now we have an additive inverse has to be an element in the field in order for that particular set of numbers to represent a field. So this is now the additive
inverse. The second inverse is the multiplicative in inverse, which says that for every non-zero element A in our field of numbers, there exists an A inverse that's also in the field such that A inverse times A gives us back 1. And that's now the multiplicative inverse. And then another property that these numbers in a set have to satisfy in order for that set to be a field is that these numbers have to be or satisfy the distributive property. Such that if we have three elements in this set, F, then for that set to be a field, we need A times B plus C to equal AB plus, whoops, AC. Now, Examples of sets of numbers that form fields are the obvious. We have the real numbers. That's a set of numbers and they actually form a field. The set of complex numbers is also a field of numbers. A set of numbers that is now Q or rational numbers, all three of these actually, these sets are rich enough that they actually satisfy those five properties that allow them to be a field. So if you need a field of numbers, then you could talk about real numbers, complex numbers, rational numbers. What can you not? Well, I just answered my own question. Let's think of another set. Suppose that we have the set of integers, z, And what if I claim the set of integers z is not a field? Why is that true? So now if we have these integers, can we find another integer in that set of integers when multiplied by another integer will give us the unity or one. Now if I give you four as an integer, can you find an integer which when scaled by four will give you one? No. So the integers are not a fee or do not form a field and is where the problem arises. And you can think of many different examples that now just given any integer that's not one to begin with, you can't find another integer unless you start doing modular arithmetic. Then you can do modular arithmetic and now you can create fields that are maybe zero, one, and it's now modular 
one, for example. That could be a field. Now, I've already used it in the above, and I tried to explain it, but let me just make it clear. Many times, we will be able to prove results for both fields. Here I'm referring to R and C. simultaneously. And because of that, the book knows that, and it's just agreed to use then this more generic symbol, the F for field. The book uses F for either R or C. Now we have an idea of one term that we need to be very comfortable with, which is a field. Now let's talk about something else that maybe seems very basic, but it's very important to understand the difference. List. Now let's talk about a list of numbers or something else. An ordered group. of n objects where typically these objects will be numbers. But the key here and is the fact that we're saying it's an ordered group. And this n is a finite number. Meaning a list might be x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub n, where all of these objects in that ordered list belong to the field or are elements of the field, F. If little n was actually equal to 2, we might call that, or we do call that, an ordered pair. Assume an ordered pair. Now you just have a list that's of length 2, x sub 1 and x sub 2. If little n was 3, Now we have an ordered triple. And those are easy to visualize, but we can algebraically generalize that, and what that's what we typically do. If we now just have n, now we might call that an n-tuple. And a lot of times we want to reduce what we're writing or referring to and for that reason when possible we will use a single variable to represent an entire list. And hopefully it will be clear from the context what that means. Meaning we may just say x and that is now referring to some list of n objects. Yes? Now, x sub 1 and x sub 2 and x sub 3, I'm not sure that you want to think about those as being larger or smaller. So, 
It's ordered, so I'll get to an example, but x sub 1 could be 4, and x sub 2 could be 2, and then x sub 3 could be 3. But the order of 4, 2, 3 is what's important. They're ordered. That's different than a list that's 3, 2, 4. Now, they may, if you had 4, 3, and 2 in a set, it wouldn't matter how you had them ordered. But the order is essential in this class when we're talking about a list. So now you have to distinguish between a list and a set. Yes, so now it's like this permutation and com commutation. Now you need to make sure that you're comfortable with this concept and it's a list now and order matters. Yes? Do I mean what? No. So now, so the question was, when I say set, do I mean a field? And now I'm meaning no, it's more of a set. So let me try to make this a little bit more clear, and let me call this an important note. Here I'm saying a set is just a collection of objects, and a list is a set that is, the order is important in that, let's say, group of objects. So a set is just a group of objects. And in this case, we're talking about it being of finite length, that list. If I say list, then the order of those elements or objects in that list matter. If I say this is a set, then it may not, it doesn't matter how I order those objects in that set. But now if I had a set of numbers, does that set of numbers form a field? That's a different concept, but you could now have a field that is a, made up of lists of n ordered objects. And then you may say that's r to the n, where all of the objects or components, I'm getting ahead of myself, but each of the components in that list is coming from the real number line. Let me try to make that a little bit better. Now we say a list is not a set. In a list, order and repetition matter in a list. Meaning, let me try to give you a distinction. Suppose I give you, say you have a set, and in that set you have 2, 4, and 4. If it's a set, how many unique numbers are in that set? 2. Well, maybe this was a bad choice, but you have two numbers, and these sets are equivalent. 2, 4, 4 is equivalent to the set 2, 4, which is equivalent to 4, 2. Contrast that with a list where now 2, comma, 4 comma 4 is definitely not the same as 4 comma 2 comma 4 and it's definitely not the same as this list of numbers 2 4. So when I'm making a distinction between a list and a set. Question. So now the question was can we be thinking about a list being a vector? And yes, you can, where that's maybe what you're comfortable with. You want to relate some of these new concepts to something that you're very familiar with. But we want to generalize the concept of a vector so that a vector doesn't have to be necessarily a tall, thin list of numbers maybe a vector is actually going to be a matrix, and we'll call that matrix a vector. 
because that's one of the objects in our set of objects. But here the list means something different than a set. Is that clear? And now we can start talking. If we have a list, then the length of that list is important. And where we are in that list, maybe we need to be able to communicate that or define that. And that's what we will use the next word, which is the coordinate. where the coordinate is an element of a list. For example, and a lot of times I will just abbreviate that as E period, G period. For example, X equal to X sub 1, X sub 2, x sub n, then x sub 1, we will call that the first coordinate. x sub 2, I think you can guess, <laughs> is the second coordinate, etc. So that x sub n is the nth coordinate. And now the fact that that list is a fixed length allows us to define operations on that list when we couldn't do that with a set. A set maybe is just this collection of objects. Now with a list, that allows us to talk about a collection of objects, but where they are in that list is very important. Now we can talk about addition. Where list addition is element-wise, addition of the coordinates. Meaning, if we now have a vector, or a, I should say a, a list, I haven't maybe talked about a vector that much yet in class, made up of a sum or an addition of two lists x and y, then the list z is going to be the first coordinates added together in X and Y, the second coordinates, etc., up to the nth coordinate added up, where this is now Z1, Z sub 2, Z sub n. If we have a list, then we can comfortably talk about the addition of those lists. They ob obviously have to be compatible. They have to be the same length. We can also talk about scalar multiplication. Where now multiplication of a list by a scalar number, let's say A, that belongs to some field of numbers, then that scalar multiplication is actually defined as element-wise multiplication by the single or the individual scalar. By that, I mean if we had a scalar A times X, 
A is now a scalar, and X is our list, then that means that we scale the first component by A, the second component, so it's component or element-wise multiplication by the scalar A. Yes. So now you can think of a list as a vector. So in a vector, we can add element-wise in vectors. So if you had, typically I like to think of vectors as being tall, thin columns of numbers. Now if you have a three-dimensional vector, you have three numbers in a column, and you can add those two vectors together. You can't be combining, though, a vector that lives in R3 with a vector that lives in R7. They have to be compatible, these vectors. But once you have vectors, you can add those vectors. So this is the addition that I'm wanting to use. So now we have a list addition, which we will then start talking about vectors, and that will then just carry over into the vector addition that you're used to. So let's now, since you're wanting to get into vectors, let's get into the next piece, which is vector spaces. So now we want to talk about a vector space, and this is very important, obviously, since it's the focus of the first chapter, and this is now on page 9. But a vector space, what I want you to sort of leave today with is that the main idea of a vector space is that you have... really three things happening, or three concepts. You have a set, and there you can think of a set of objects. And with respect to that one set, you have two operations. Where those two operations you have a vector addition, which we were just calling a list addition before. But now, I don't want you to always be locked in to what you might traditionally think a vector is. We are going to generalize this concept of a vector. But here, a vector just means that these are elements of our set. So we had a, have a set of elements, and each element in that set we will refer to as a vector. Now we have, we pull two elements out of that set, and we can form vector addition. We can combine those two elements with an addition. That's one of the two operations. We have vector addition and scalar multiplication. And in this particular elements of a set, we really want to view the term vector in a very abstract way. So that we have an abstract usage of this word vector. Let me define what I mean by a vector space. Any set, and I'll call that set of elements V, capital V. 
and those elements are now lists. Any set V of lists that has the following properties One of the properties is that it's closed under addition. And what that closed means is that if you add two elements in that set, their sum is in the set. So it's closed. It doesn't go outside the set when you add things within the set. If you had two elements, X and Y, starting in the set V, then their sum, their addition is in V. So X and Y started or they're in elements of V, then their sum is in V, so it's closed under addition, and it's closed under scalar multiplication. Meaning if we start with an element of the set, X, and we take A from our field of numbers, then if we scale that element in the set, X, by any number A in our field of numbers, we will remain in that set. We also want to have the same kind of properties that we had with the fields. So now we have commutativity, meaning that x plus y is equal to y plus x, when x and y are elements of the set V, we have associativity, where now we have x plus y plus z, that's the same as x plus y plus z, and a b x is equal to a times b x, where all of these x, y, z are in the set V and A and B are in our field. We also want to have an additive identity. Really all that says is we want a zero element so that x plus 0 is equal to x, where 0 and x are both in our set, v. We have a multiplicative identity, which means that we have 1 in our field, and when we scale an element by one, we get the element back. Yes? So one is a scalar here, isn't it? One is in our field. So now we have this multiplicative identity where if we have a field of numbers, we have a 1, and if we scale, use that as our scalar on any element in our set, then we get back that original element in our set X. So 1 in this case is a scalar. And it's important to know what these different objects are that we are presenting in an equation. Here 1 is a scalar, and it's scaling X. We also want to have an additive inverse, not inverses, an additive inverse,
which says that for every x in v, there exists a y in v such that if we add x and y, we end up with the zero vector. And let me finish, thank you for your patience, with the last property, which is the distributive property. And that says that if we have A, a scalar, scaling the sum of two elements in our set that we're adding, x plus y, that's the same as scaling x and y individually and adding that scaled version. And if we have two scalars and we add those and use those to scale x, that's the same as taking a and scaling x and b and scaling x and adding those results. Those properties all need to be true or valid in order for us to have a vector space. If we have a set with two, we'll call binary operations, they take two values and those two values could either be two lists or two vectors, or it could be a scalar and a list or vector. We have the addition and the scalar multiplication properties, and that forms a vector space. We'll pick up at that point on Wednesday with some examples, and you might want to be reading so that those examples don't catch you completely off guard on Wednesday.